Welcome to the UCLA Anderson Forecast March 2020 Virtual Economic Outlook. Uh, we're sitting here in Corn Hall. We expected to be here today with 450 people, and we have an empty audience uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, just 15 minutes before this started, the World Health Organization uh, designated the coronavirus outbreak as a pandemic. And so I know you all are trying to be safe and uh, are at home. And this is a policy that UCLA has instituted campus-wide. So we're going to do our forecast today uh, virtually. Hopefully it's the only virtual forecast. And we are postponing the business of healthcare theme that we had planned to do today. That's going to be done in the September conference and hopefully the coronavirus pandemic will have run its course by then. And it'll be really interesting to have these healthcare professionals back uh, on campus talking about, uh, in retrospect, what happened there and how technology and the uh, processes of healthcare managed or failed to manage the current health crisis. Uh, what we're going to do today is go through the forecast, and the forecast is uh, focused on the impact of the coronavirus pandemic on the US and California, and uh, later you'll hear about the Bay Area economy. And uh, we have a couple of special presentations as well. So let me begin by introducing the forecast team. Now you see only three of the five of us up here, uh, and there's a good reason for that. Uh, so the first presentation we're going to have is from uh, Dr. William Yu, but William has uh, bronchitis today. And uh, not to worry, it is not coronavirus, been tested, everything's good, but he didn't want to be kind of coughing through his presentation. I'm going to do my best imitation of William and, uh, and read through his presentation. He's briefed me on that. And, and then following William, who's going to set the stage uh, for how we look at the impact of the coronavirus on the economic outlook, uh, we'll have a presentation by David Shulman. And you notice that David is not up here. Uh, David, following uh, Senator Ted Cruz, has self-quarantined at his home in Santa Fe and will be coming to us via the magic of the internet. Uh, and then I will follow David uh, with the California outlook. And following that, we're going to bring David back in uh, via a, a, an audio link and have a discussion about what's happening in the U.S. and California and what the issues are. Uh, we have a, a special uh, presentation today that we have added in the chief economist from RSM, Joe Bersuelis, is here. We'll have a conversation with what RSM is uh, talking to their clients about and, uh, and how they view fiscal and monetary policy in this uh, time of pandemic. Uh, so that's the program. That's where we're, we're going today. Uh, so let me uh, begin with the introductions. And I think I didn't start by introducing myself, although I think all of you know me. Uh, I'm Jerry Nicholsberg. I'm the director of the forecast. Our first presentation is going to be from William Yu. William joined the forecast a decade ago, uh, has his PhD from University of Washington, and uh, he works on special topics. He works on China and uh, regions in California. And as I said mo a moment ago, uh, I'll be doing William's presentation uh, and then uh, after that, when we move to two special presentations, uh, we have uh, Professor Ed Lemer, who you all know. Ed uh, was director of the forecast for 17 years, uh, preceded me, and, uh, and certainly was uh, my mentor as I sat at his feet all that time, and still do. And uh, Ed is going to talk about some research that he's been doing on the minimum wage. It, relates somewhat to the coronavirus, but it hopefully uh, this research is uh, such that it, it will really transcend and will be uh, uh, useful long after this pandemic is over with. 
So that's going to be in a separate video uh, for you to watch. And, uh, and then we have uh, all the way over on my far left, your right, uh, Lila Bengali. She's in her first year with the forecast, came to us from Yale University, specializes in behavioral economics, and uh, with me does the California forecast, and also looking at issues in the Bay Area. And she's got a really interesting presentation on some work that is just in its early stages, uh, but is, you know, is really going to shed light on issues of homelessness, of congestion, and of migration, and what that means for the Bay Area, specifically and more generally California. Uh, so that's where we're going to go. Uh, I haven't introduced David, uh, and uh, David has been with the forecast for 15 years. Uh, he had a distinguished career in academia and on Wall Street, uh, and, uh, and then came back and rejoined the forecast, and he's been doing our uh, national forecast. So you'll hear from him for a minute. So before I begin, what I'd like to do is, I'd like to thank the sponsors for our San Francisco event. And uh, to begin with our principal sponsor, RSM. Uh, so RSM is, has been a big su supporter of the forecast and of our San Francisco event, most appreciative of RSM. At the Platinum Level University Credit Union, who is uh, present in many universities uh, across California, including the University of California system. Uh, a new sponsor, United Airlines. Uh, we welcome United Airlines on board and thank them very much for their support. And at the silver level, uh, Kenneth Broad, Chip Robertson, Warland Investments, uh, and we very much thank them. Uh, we could not do this program with uh, University of California, California Hastings uh, School of Law without their generous support. We are going to bring to you the program that was postponed a little later in the year, and we're gonna focus on pensions in this program. And uh, as we're gonna talk about, interest rates are going down, the economy is not gonna grow very fast. That is an important policy implications for public pensions. So look for the announcement for that to be coming soon. And also, uh, if you have not heard your company's name as part of the sponsors, uh, we welcome you on board for the upcoming event. So please contact us. Uh, and I would like to thank uh, Jared Elias, who is professor of law and director of the uh, Business Law Institute at UC Hastings uh, for his support and for the support of all of the UC, UC Hastings team, as well as the UCLA team, who put together a very fine conference that's going to be coming to you shortly. Okay, so now let's turn to our program. And we're gonna begin with the work of Dr. William Yu, who looked at what's happening with coronavirus. And can we say something at this early stage of the game, or what we think may be the early stage of the game, about the economic impact of that based on some past data? Uh, so as I mentioned earlier, uh, William is unable to do the presentation right now. So, this is my best imitation of him, which is not an imitation at all. Uh, but we start off with this lead slide, predicting the economic impact of the coronavirus on the global economy. And what you see in the picture here are flight attendants on Cathay Dragon. Cathay Dragon is an airline that flies from Hong Kong into many Chinese cities, including Wuhan, uh, which, uh, so as you can imagine, they're not doing much business right now. Very serious economic impact when it comes to airlines and the transportation industry. I'm gonna talk about that in a minute. Uh, but let's start out with uh, estimating the overall impact of the epidemic. What this research does is it goes back and looks for something that we can extrapolate from. And there's actually not much out there. But what is out there is the SARS epidemic that occurred in 2003. And this uh, happened between March and, and May. And so William looked at a study by, um, uh, by Lee and, and McKick, Mc, McNicken. Is that McNicken? McKibben. It says McKibben on that. McKibben. Uh, sorry, the monitor's a little far away for me. Um, 
so, so he looked at the study uh, by Lee and McKibben, uh, which analyzed the economic impact of the SARS epidemic over three months period of time, used global modeling and tried to extract uh, you know, what happened there. And that's gonna be the basis for this analysis. So let's begin with what happened with SARS. The confirmed cases over 8,000, uh, fatalities were about 770. Uh, it in, infected around 17 countries. Uh, the fatality rate, and as you probably heard, fatality rates are really hard to measure, but the measured fatality rate was 9.6%. And the most affected countries were in East Asia, as China, Taiwan, and Hong Kong. And we're gonna talk about why that is and what that means for uh, extrapolating from this to today. So the coronavirus today, uh, it really kind of exploded in, on the world stage here uh, in February of this year. There are already 118,000 cases. Well, that was before today, it keeps going up. Uh, there have been over 4,000 uh, fatalities it's in 112 countries. And the fatality rate, well, the, you know, the numbers are kind of all over the board, but maybe in the two to 3%, might be a little lower might be a little higher. We have to wait till the uh, pandemic runs its course to really know the answer to that. And, uh, you know, it is spread much more widely. It's in China, Italy, South Korea, uh, Spain, the US, uh, France, and Japan. So uh, a lot of differences between SARS and the coronavirus. So let's move on uh, and look at the SARS impact. It was active for three months. Uh, the global economic impact was estimated to be about $40 billion uh, in, that's over the three months, and about one-tenth of one percent of annual GDP for that year. Uh, and, uh, and it was focused, as I said before, on China at 1% and on Hong Kong at 2.6%. And if we come up here to extrapolate to 2020 and the coronavirus, uh, we're first gonna make an assumption that it's active for three months. We really don't know, we're not epidemiologists, and indeed the epidemiologists are not certain at this point in time. Uh, but right now we've got about five and a half uh, times the number of fatalities. Uh, that uh, obviously will change. Uh, and then the global economic impact, uh, we're estimating just by extrapolating here, that it would be about $500 billion on an annualized basis, or 0.55% of global GDP. Uh, but there's some issues involved here. And, and the issues that you see on the left-hand side here are that China plays a much larger role in global supply chains. In 2003, China had just recently joined the WTO. We didn't have the globalized world that we have today. And China is also a much larger economy. And then we also have other large economies that are really uh, uh, very heavily impacted, such as Japan, South Korea, and, and the United States, and some European countries. Uh, and we're in a situation where the number of cases and the deaths are still rising. So there are a lot of issues on, you know, when we extrapolate from SARS to today. Uh, but still in doing that and making our best uh, guess, uh, we have, if this runs, for three months, uh, that the global economic impact is gonna be $880 billion, or about 1% of global GDP. Uh, the monthly loss is going to be uh, around 73 billion. So if you can kind of take that, if it goes for four months or five months, uh, or even less, only two months, uh, you can use that to adjust that number. And the impact, uh, as you see there on China, about 4%. On the US, we're estimating and David's gonna talk about this in his presentation, uh, a, an impact of a reduction in our forecast of 0.7%. So uh, let's move on and look at a few other factors uh, that could influence these estimates. And uh, one is that markets uh, have kind of been in a panic. Mar the market today is down again, at least right now, by about four and a half percent. So we see the fin financial markets are really spooked by this, both the economic impact and the response by the federal government. Uh, if we 
now turn to the tourism or transportation industry, uh, which we said at the outset would be a hard hit industry, and look for some data. What you see in the graph here is, uh, is Hong Kong tourism, and it kind of goes up, and then there's a spike down at SARS. That's not a one-month spike. The panel on the right shows you the monthly changes there, and then comes kind of right back, and that's very typical of events that impact tourism. And then over on the right, you've got another uh, decline uh, with the protests that have been going on in Hong Kong. We don't actually have any data uh, subsequent to the outbreak of coronavirus here. Uh, another set of data that uh, William looked at was the September 11 hit to transportation in the US. And this you can see pretty clearly there is not down and quickly back up, but is much more U-shaped. And so uh, what he did in the analysis was assume that it's something in between those two. Uh, this graph shows you uh, tourism spending. The blue is actual tourism spending. And if you look kind of closely here, you can see it drops in recessions and it dropped at the time of SARS. The, the yellow or ochre color, uh, there is uh, spending by flight crews and the like, and the uh, green is medical tourism and the like. Uh, but you can see it has these fluctuations. We're expecting that kind of fluctuation as well. So taking a look at the tour in world uh, US and state tourism level, uh, we have for the world, it's a 1.6 trillion per annum uh, industry. And the monthly loss that's estimated due to this pandemic is 26 billion per month. Uh, for the US, the numbers are 260 billion with a 4.3 billion loss per month. And for California, a 57 billion with a 1.8 billion loss per month. And this is international tourism, so domestic tourism is being a hit as well. Airlines are cutting back on domestic flights, uh, so the hit could be uh, even much larger in the US and California. Uh, in addition, many US companies are exposed to uh, foreign revenues in terms of their profitability. And you see a number of up, up here on this graph, uh, NVIDIA and Apple and Tesla and so on. Uh, that exposure means that there may be an impact on their profits. And that's one of the things that we're seeing in the decline in the stock market. Uh, global supply chains also uh, face disruption. Uh, one of the ones that folks focus on is Foxconn, which is a huge company. It supplies Apple, but also other electronics companies uh, and, and employs about a half a million people in China, uh, in, in the affected area. Uh, so they closed down. They're about 50% back to uh, normal, they are expecting to be back to normal production uh, by the 1st of April, but that remains to be seen. Uh, but the issue is not only getting the factories back up and producing, but then getting it to the ports and getting it through the ports. And then you have another month uh, on the Pacific until it gets to the U.S. ports. And, and so there are a lot of, of obstacles uh, to overcome to get back to normal in the supply chain which is gonna affect the US economy going forward over the next two quarters. Uh, so, you know, in conclusion, uh, the current estimate that you see here is that minus 1% of global GDP, it's gonna be about a 0.7% hit to US growth rates. That's not a decline in US GDP by 0.7%, but a hit to growth rates. It's hitting the transportation industry hard, the logistics industry. We're going to talk about that in the California and U.S. forecast. Uh, and uh, we may just be in the beginning of this pandemic. So these estimates are ones that you can kind of take with a grain of salt. They're extrapolated, but they do give us some order of magnitude of what's happening uh, here in the world economy. And that's going to serve the basis for our next presentation, uh, which will be remote from Santa Fe, New Mexico, uh, by David Schulman. All right. Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm sorry about the uh, strange circumstances we're living under, but it is what it is. This is the second forecast we actually did 
uh, for March. We put together a forecast in, in the middle of February, and we were basically calling for 2% growth plus or minus over the next three years. And Jerry said, and Jerry called the uh, forecast very boring. And then in late, uh, then in late uh, February, uh, the impact of the coronavirus began to be felt. And we called an audible. We put together a new forecast. And, and this, and this forecast is, is coronavirus. It's both a supply shock and a demand shock. And if you take a look at the first uh, uh, slide, uh, it, it's showing the impact on supply and demand. And basically all these office buildings and the trains and stuff uh, have face masks on them basically uh, there to basically we work to inhibit the uh, commerce. The next thing, another way of looking at what happened is with the coronavirus is it, the world economy got hit with a mine. And the big question is, is whether it's above or below the waterline is critical. And our, our, our sense is, is it's beginning to look more maybe below the line than, than above the line, above the waterline. So the thing is, what happened is uh, a public health emergency has morphed into an economic emergency. Uh, and let me point out, the forecast you're seeing right now uh, was done prior to the big collapse in oil prices caused by uh, Saudi Arabia uh, deciding to break with OPEC and, and, and pump huge amounts of oil triggering a major drop in, in oil prices. Uh, our guess is if we had to do this forecast over again today, uh, it would be uh, more bearish and we might have two negative quarters or possibly a recession in the forecast. And, and the true supply and demand shocks that we think have yet to hit the economy, uh, growth is going to slow dr dramatically. Uh, and on, on the slide in front of you saying no recession yet, but there may be a recession out there and it may be coming pretty soon. The Fed has cut rates dramatically, and there's more to come. But you have to remind everybody that low interest rate is no substitute for vaccines or cures. Uh, and, and finally, the one help that low rates may bring with it is is that three and a quarter percent mortgages that might help housing, and housing could be a bright spot, at least relatively speaking, uh, for 2020 and into 2021. So if you take a look what's happening in the stock market, this is uh, plotted as of the end of February, and we had the big, we had the stocks had their worst week since the financial crisis of 2008. Stocks continued to wobble, and, and in fact, uh, they went as low as 2,700 on the chart here. They were 2,970 or so. They hit 20, they hit almost hit 2,700 uh, uh, last uh, last week. So our sense is, or, or this week, and so our sense is, is th this still could be worse ahead of the stock market. Or maybe we're in the bottoming process. So as we say, time will tell. The other thing that's happened is, is that bond yield drops to a record low. And at the end of February, the Treasury was in these basis points. It fell as low as 40 basis points uh, yesterday. And is now uh, back up today, it's trading at around 75 basis points. These are record low 10-year Treasury. You know, the 30-year Treasury bond dropped below 1%. And it seemed to me that with the 30-year Treasury at 1%, the government should borrow a lot of money and fund lots of infrastructure. If they want to help the economy, that would be a, the best way, in my opinion, to help the economy, certainly in the long run. The next thing is, is we had this big collapse in oil prices uh, due to the coronavirus. Now, how does the coronavirus lower oil prices? Well, for all practical purposes, uh, China shut down. China's the biggest uh, importer of oil in the world. And, and, and as a result, uh, oil demand uh, collapsed, uh, bringing oil down to forty-one dollars a barrel. Then uh, Russia broke with OPEC and decided it was not going to go along with production cuts to maintain uh, prices. So, uh, with OPEC pump pumping uh, and, and Russia pumping, the price of oil dropped to thirty-two dollars a barrel. That has huge negative uh, uh, effects on capital spending and, and the oil patch. And even though lower oil prices are good for the economy, the United States really should be a part of OPEC because we're the biggest oil producer in the world right now. Uh, we're producing 13 million barrels a day, and that's way up from the 5 million barrels a day, say, about 2006, 2007. Uh, we'll, we produce more oil than Saudi Arabia and more, more oil uh, than Russia. So a drop in oil prices, even though it doesn't feel that way for consumers, a drop in oil prices is really a negative 
uh, uh, to the uh, to the economy. Our forecast, as of a week ago, says uh, we had the GDP uh, growth uh, stalling with uh, supply chains disrupted and, and weak, a weaker consumer, and so we had growth slowing from a two plus percent rule to one point seven percent in the first quarter, which we still think is pretty good. We have one point three percent in the in the second quarter. 0.6% in the third quarter, and then a recovery to around 2.5% for a couple of quarters. But like I said at the outset, if we were to do this, if we were to do this again, our sense is we might have a minus sign in front of the uh, second quarter and possibly a minus sign in, in front of the third quarter. And we're making the, the assumption is, is, is that most of the impact of the coronavirus will be behind us by the uh, fourth quarter. That right now, I, I guess you could call that that may be heroic, it may not be heroic, but that's what we're doing for modeling purposes. In this environment, employment growth is going to take a hit, and we have a big drop in, in the third quarter of down about 300,000 jobs. A lot of that will come from the uh, laying off of census workers who were temporarily hired uh, for the for the Jesse and Yell census, uh, which is starting uh, which is starting uh, this month, and then we get get a recovery. And the sense is also is, is that we're not going to be getting the 200,000 or so jobs we've been used to a month, and they'll probably slow to about 100,000 a month. Uh, we have the unemployment rate upticking from around 3.5% to 3.8%, and then gradually uh, dropping. If we had an inflation, if we had a recession, uh, the unemployment rate would probably go to around 4.25%, possibly even 4.5%. If we get those negative, if we get those negative uh, quarters, now one of the things that made the employment report both in January and also in February really look good, of the 273,000 jobs each month, is January was unusually warm. And if you take a look at the map of the United States, there was no part of the United States the temperatures were below average, meaningfully below average, and the, most of the country was either much above average or above average, and, and you can see that especially across the entire Northeast. And this carried over into February, even though later in the month it got cold, is because the employment survey takes place in the second week in February, so we got extra hiring for outdoor activities like construction, and also uh, uh, restaurants and bars and people would go out more, uh, uh, would go out to eat more, so that uh, helped employment in, the, in, in those, sectors of, those sectors of the economy. Uh, and this is also another sign is, is that uh, the, the, the world is getting hotter. Now, uh, last week, the Fed made a dramatic interest rate cut. It was done intermeeting, so it's an emergency. And what they did is, is they cut the funds rate from 1.58% to 1.08%. We think there will be more, more to come and, and when they meet uh, next week, and rates could get as low as 3 eighths of a percent. Uh, our sense is, is that the Fed will be very reluctant to raise rates until they see inflation well above its target, or moderately above its target, for a sustained period because they want to catch up to the time when inflation ran below ran below its target. So we probably will be in an environment where the, the base rate or the policy rate will remain low for a long time. We just have it increasing at the end of 2022 just to give a sense that it's not going to stay, uh, stay low forever. And we also will have the inflation above their target for a sustained uh, period of time. The other thing that the Fed is going to do is, is they're going to continue with a balance sheet expansion that they did to cure the quote the repo problem of plumbing in the financial system. And and they were tapering their balance sheet from 2018 off the middle of 2018. They're taking the balance sheet down. They had a problem in the repo market that they decided there was insufficient reserves in the system because the dot frank requirements were in excess of the reserve requirements of the Fed to get into the weeds here. And our sense is the balance sheet is going to begin to increase, and it's going to look a lot like the PE programs of 2008, 2012, and, and 2013 and 14. So we would expect the balance sheet to reach new highs uh, uh, this year. The other thing, and then on inflation, inflation is going to stay low, uh, and this environment is manageable around 2% on core and well below 2% on headline. And with the recent drop in the price of oil, you expect that headline inflation, which is the dark blue line, will go below zero, which is what happened in 2015, the last time we had a major drop 
in oil prices. So we're going to have very, very low headline inflation uh, for quite a while until the anniversary of uh, these drops in oil prices. And it remains to be seen what kind of recovery in oil prices that we'll see. The other thing that's going to happen is, is with the consumer is, 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 is the consumer is going to reduce travel, recreation, travel-related activities are going to be hit hard. It also may be hard to get items such as iPhones because of supply shocks in, 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 uh, in China, as well as clothing and shoes, much of which comes from, comes from China. So we have a big drop in consumption in the second and third quarters, and then it rebounds. Now, if everybody's going to be housebound, and, and for example, in Santa Fe, where I live right now, is it is impossible to buy a roll of toilet paper. At least that was true as of, uh, as of yesterday. Uh, uh, so we're going to have a, a, a big drop in, we have a drop in the greater growth in consumption. And in fact, if the country really hunkers down, uh, the growth in consumption could actually, uh, could actually go, go negative. And that would happen in our recession uh, scenario. The, the bright spot, potentially the bright spot in our forecast is housing. Because of uh, and housing starts are running about a hundred thousand units above our prior estimates, and that's three and a quarter percent mortgage is certainly going to help. And housing was recovering, doing very well before uh, uh, the coronavirus appeared. In fact, housing starts in December were the highest since two thousand and six, I believe, uh, which is a long way from from the very the low of six hundred thousand we were seeing during the financial crisis. Uh, and we expect housing to run about 100,000 units above prior, above prior forecasts. Now, the problem may be is they may have some supply issues because a lot of hardware so, uh, houses and uh, LED bulbs and, 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 and some plumbing hardware and what have you uh, may not be available because of supply shortages coming from the shutdown in, in China and also the shutdown in, in uh, South Korea. But we, we, we think housing will, will run between... A, a million three fifty and around a million three to a million four hundred thousand units, which is above a prior view of a million two to a million three. Uh, we have a recovery in business fixed investment in this run after five quarters of declines. Part of that recovery is coming from the, our assumption that the seven thirty seven max uh, will start to be will start deliveries in the third quarter. Now it's very interesting is, is a lot of the major buyers of the airplane uh, where Asian Airlines and several of them are filed for bankruptcy. So they may not, not only may want to ship the plane, but the airline may not want to accept the plane. So it's going to be very interesting as to how all this thing plays out. And there's some issues with the wiring design of the plane that may delay uh, the deliveries from the third quarter to the fourth quarter, uh, but we're not smart enough to know where it will be the third, third or fourth quarter. Uh, quarter on that, but that will support business investment. However, the big drop in, in the price of oil will cause a cratering of, of oil field related capital spending in the business structures account. And when people think of construction, business construction, they think of shopping centers and office buildings and hotels, but a big chunk of structure construction is, is offshore oil wells and, and drilling rigs, and, and, and that's going to nosedive. And we did notice that when, when the price of oil dropped on, on Monday, uh, two of the worst performing, among the worst performing stocks, aside from the oil, small oil companies themselves, were Schlumberger and Halbert, the two biggest suppliers of oil field equipment uh, to, to the industry. So this is a big, we have a big question mark around this, and there'll be bigger negative numbers uh, coming. Another thing interesting about the economy in recent years is, is, is that the secret source of the Trump economy, where we got almost 3% growth for a couple of years, is, is that, it, that the growth hasn't really come from the tax cuts. It came from increased spending. And we have three years in a row of increased, of increased uh, uh, government purchases uh, uh, of, uh, of equipment and, and personnel. And, and, that, and that has been one of the major props for the economy. Now, what the Trump administration decides to do and Congress decides to do with respect to, to spending money or cutting taxes uh, to deal with the coronavirus issue remains uh, to be seen. Although I did say, I did say today uh, that they're, they're talking about suspending all payroll taxes, whether it's on, on the employee side or the uh, or the, the 
all inside of, of payroll taxes. Uh, we'll see if Congress goes along with that or not, but I just saw that on the wire earlier uh, uh, today. The other thing is is the deficits of a trillion dollars or more that we're starting to see. They're going to be there with us forever, and especially if the economy goes into recession, if it's just going to be increased. Uh, generically, uh, a higher level of spending with an unwillingness uh, to raise taxes. Now, if Democrats come in, we'll probably see big, big increases in taxes and big increases in spending. So it isn't clear what will happen uh, to the deficit. So my, my, my conclusions are, the forecast here is, is a, a growth slowdown for two quarters. This was our first pass. If we had to do a second, if we had to do another pass on the impact of the coronavirus, we might have in not two quarters of a, a slowdown, we might have two quarters of a, a recession. That remains uh, to be seen. Stay tuned. Uh, supply chains have been disrupted and consumption growth is stalling. Uh, the Fed cut rates dramatically, but that's not going to cure the virus. Inflation will remain low and manageable. The three and a quarter percent mortgages, housing will be a, a bright spot in the economy if we have a bright spot. Uh, and, and we also think the presidential election brings with it a lot of political risk. And the thing is, is, is we were looking at a, a, a race between uh, Bernie Sanders and, and Donald Trump. Uh, at least half of that, that risk, at least half of that risk has been lessened after Super Tuesday and, and uh, possibly uh, yesterday. Thank you. Thank you, David. And I noticed that while you were talking, uh, Ed has been writing down questions. So uh, we have about 15, 20 minutes and we'll link you back in on uh, an audio link. So you have time to prepare for Ed's questions. But before that, let's turn to the California forecast. So David talked a lot about the uncertainty that exists today in the economy. And uh, I wanna expand on that, but also uh, tell you how we focused in on getting the California forecast this time. And, and to do that, uh, let's start off with our forecast for 2020 and 2021 last December. We had payroll job growth of 1%, then slowing to 0.7%. Our first forecast, which was in February, uh, we had 1.3% and 1.2%. Part of that was due to the phase one trade agreement with China and the signing of NAFTA 2.0 or USMCA, and part due to pretty good job numbers, and we're gonna explore those job numbers momentarily. Uh, unemployment rate at 4.3%, uh, but then bumping up to about 4.6% as the economy slowed, but still not really uh, recession. And then our view in February was that it wasn't gonna bump up, that it was gonna be at 4.2%, kind of moving along smoothly, and this is what David uh, described as, uh, as me having said that it's a boring forecast. Uh, actually, I was going to title this uh, that it's another tequila sunrise. Uh, this old world still looks the same, another frame from the Eagles song, Tequila Sunrise, because it's just not much changing. But then what happened was, of course, coronavirus and much changed. And that affects in California, uh, amongst other things, transportation and warehousing, William's uh, talk was about uh, that and about leisure and hospitality, uh, but also retail and wholesale trade and manufacturing. And, and we're gonna look at some of these and see how that impacts uh, the California forecast. So the roadmap is to look at some data. Where were we up until the time that the coronavirus outbreak really took hold? And uh, that's in the logistics industry, in tourism, in housing and then in employment and what was happening with California GDP. And then I wanna show you an illustration of how we adjusted the forecast relative to that previous one and that'll lead to the forecast. So to begin with logistics, uh, this is goods movement through the three major seaports of California. And you can see it turns red, it turns negative. And this is the impact of the trade wars. And so it's negative going all the way through uh, January 2020, which is over on the right. Those are those red bars. And we expected this to turn around and be positive and be blue bars going through the year. Uh, now it looks like at least for the next uh, six months, that won't be the case. Uh, for logistics in terms of airports, this is domestic goods movement through the airports of Southern California, which is on the bottom, and Northern Ca 
I'm sorry, which is on the top, and Northern California, which is on the bottom. And as you can see, it was trending upwards, but then kind of flattened out in 2019, even a slight negative in Northern California. There's a spike there at the end, and that's the opening of Amazon Air's uh, hub at Ontario Airport. Uh, but for the most part, we have, in terms of goods movement, not a lot happening. So the logistics industry uh, you know, certainly has been moving sideways, if not uh, a slightly negative. In terms of tourism, and William's talk was a lot about uh, international tourism. So this is on the top international arrivals at LAX, and it's through January of 2020, and it's basically flat. And the bottom is SFO. It's also flat. That's only through December, uh, but we expect now these to turn down. In terms of housing, uh, housing permits also have been flat of late. In fact, uh, we're producing homes uh, at, at a rate that's just a little over 100,000 uh, per year. And if you subtract out uh, the homes that are being built, actually rebuilt after these uh, tragic wildfires, we're under 100,000 new units per year. So will that increase? Uh, that's really gonna depend on what happens in uh, the market for homes, both sales and prices, because that's what influences builders uh, to build more. So let's take a look at that. This is existing single family home sales. This is California Association of Realtors data. And we are going on about uh, 420,000 per year. And then with the advent of the new tax law uh, and the SALT limitations, followed by increasing interest rates, we get a decline in home sales. And now it seems to have flattened out over the last year at a lower level than before, but at least that's stabilized. And that stabilization of home sales uh, gives builders some sense that they're going to be able to sell what they uh, actually construct uh, six months out. The February numbers look pretty good, but we haven't seen uh, you know, the final numbers for February. And what happens in March is, is really an open question now. Uh, in terms of home prices, on the left-hand side is the uh, median home price in California, and it's flat to negative, right? So we're not having much home price, price appreciation. On the right-hand side is for three cities in California. This is the Case-Shiller Home Price Index. The top line is San Francisco, followed by San Diego and Los Angeles. And so if you just focus on that right-hand side, you can see San Francisco is actually slightly negative in home prices. LA and San Diego, slightly positive, but the recent decrease in home mortgage rates uh, means that housing affordability has increased in California. It's not affordable yet, but it, the affordability has at least increased. And all of this suggests that we're gonna have uh, more demand for homes and we'll get some increase in homes, but we have a lot of uncertainty about that. Uh, and I'll come back to our forecast on this momentarily. Uh, here, what you see is payroll job growth in California, and the numbers of the top are the average monthly net job gains uh, for 2016 through 2019. And you see that in, in, uh, in 2017, it was up in 32,000, and, and then it dropped to 23,000 uh, net new jobs per month. Uh, now it's bounced back up. So we've had pretty good job gains and that's not reflective of an economy that's near full employment, though California unemployment rates are down at 3.9%. Where are the, uh, uh, the jobs regionally? Uh, well, what you see in this diagram is a red bar, that's the US uh, growth rate of payroll jobs, and the horizontal line going across, these are all the regions in California, everywhere is growing faster. You would expect in the Bay Area, and, and Lila will talk a little bit about that uh, later when uh, she's talking about San Francisco. Those are the first couple of bars, but also San Joaquin Valley. Also, even surprisingly, uh, the northern counties in the great state of Jefferson, in Southern California, Los Angeles, Orange County, San Diego. The only region in California growing slower than the US is Sacramento and the Delta, and this is principally in the Delta counties. So we get, uh, Good job growth throughout the state. Uh, what kinds of jobs are, are, are growing? Well, this shows you that it's 
It's kind of concentrated over on the left-hand side here with healthcare, and then after healthcare is administrative services, and that's where the uh, temps lie. The next bar that you see up here is durable goods manufacturing, and we think that's gonna take a hit due to the uh, pandemic, then state and local, then finance, and, and so on. So what is going to grow in 2020? Uh, so first of all, healthcare, and that's not a big surprise. Uh, if we don't end up having negative growth, uh, we expect administrative services, because in an economy with a lot of uncertainty, it, firms are more likely to hire temps, but they're also the first ones to be laid off. So that one is a bit uncertain. And then we have uh, finance and we have uh, uh, construction and uh, we have uh, finance, construction and state and local government as our growth areas going forward. So that's where each one of these arrows uh, are. Uh, but a lot of these like transportation uh, we expect to turn negative and to actually be a red bar as we get through uh, this year. Uh, the diagram that you see here is our monthly measure of GDP. And just to remind you, the uh, Bureau of Economic Analysis publishes GDP with a six to nine month lag. We construct a monthly measure. And, uh, and what you can see is that in late 2017, when the tax cut uh, was passed, and this is what uh, David described as the, the Trump administration's secret sauce. We had a real bump up in growth in California. That continues through 2018, and then a long kind of decline in growth, exactly what we saw in the U.S. And our latest numbers, which are for December, are for a 2.1% growth in GDP uh, in December. So the GDP growth has been slowing, and we expect that to continue. Uh, so what are the implications for the forecast? What I want to show you here is uh, what our forecast uh, was, and our forecast uh, previously was for declining growth, and this is in, in retail and wholesale trade, was for declining growth in jobs going negative. And that was the weakness that we saw back in December in the latter part of 2020. As we adjust for the impact of the coronavirus on retail and wholesale trade, it has an entirely different pattern. So it's dropping sharply uh, in the first quarter of 2020 uh, and, and, uh, and into the second quarter and, and third quarter, and then we get positive growth in the fourth quarter. So that is consistent with the national forecast that this will be behind us by the time we get to the fourth quarter, we start to have growth. But if you add up these uh, percentages, we end up with retail and wholesale trade employment lower than we had last December, even though we had 2020 as a fairly weak December. So now let's turn to our weakest quarter, and let me illustrate what's uh, happening there. This is the third quarter of this year, and uh, employment is, uh, in our forecast, down by 0.3%. That's on an annual basis. So losing jobs in the third quarter, we don't have job loss in the second quarter, though. Uh, if, uh, if we do get uh, that recession that David was talking about, then this forecast is too high. We also have the unemployment rate bumping up now to 4.6% in the third quarter. That leads us to our forecast of 0.5% uh, of growth in employment this year, followed by a 1% in 2021, and that's part of that recovery uh, from the impact of the pandemic on California in 2020, and then 2022, growing at 0.8%. Our, our unemployment rate will then bump up on average to 4.5% uh, next year. And, and, and that's kind of the holdover from 2020 and then coming back down to 4.3%. And we have some modest growth in residential construction. There are a lot of uh, constraints on residential construction, including the uncertainty. So going to 117,000 units and ultimately 121,000 that is way below what California needs to make any significant dent in affordability. So that concludes the California forecast. And what we're going to do now is uh, bring David back in on an audio link and have a discussion of the forecast amongst the four of us. And David Schulman has joined us through an audio link. So this black Bose cylinder, that's David. Uh, and 
Uh, let's begin. Who would like to raise the first issue? Well, I'll go ahead and start. This is a question that pertains both to William's presentation, the California forecast, and the US forecast. This is kind of a big picture question. So one issue with uh, looking at macroeconomic data is that these data are released, sort of they're not real time. Um, so what indicators, if you were to be able to get them in real time, would you sort of most want to see to start to understand how the coronavirus is going to affect the U.S. economy or the, and or the California economy? Well, okay. we get something, something we get real time is the unemployment claims data, which comes a week late. And that, 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 that data will be very important. It would be wonderful to have weekly retail sales, weekly hotel um, occupancies. And it would be wonderful to also have uh, traffic loads uh, for the airlines on a weekly basis. That, would, that kind of data would be terrific. Yeah, and related to retail sales, uh, I would think uh, inventory buildup, you know, if we had that in, in real time, because that's a real indication of people staying away from stores. Uh, well, I think you're seeing the opposite. I think you'd look at inventory drawdown because in lots, lots of places in the country, there's a severe toilet paper shortage. Well, maybe inventory buildup at the individual level and inventory drawdown at the firm level. Right, but yeah. we, we, don't, we normally don't get inventory at, at, at the closet level in people's homes. So I, I had a question that was related to that. Maybe it amounts to the same thing, which is uh, <clears throat> what's the scenario that lies behind our thinking with regard to the impact of this uh, virus. And um, what we all know is there's been a pullback in sales of the, of the airline industry. And that to me is mostly affecting the wealthy people. It affects the value of the airline stocks and maybe management suffers a little bit. But the critical next step is whether layoffs occur in response to that cutback in revenue. So we know that the cutback in revenue doesn't mean that the individuals are without the money. They're, they can take that money and buy toilet paper like David suggested. So there's no multiplier merely from the fact that people are not going on airlines anymore unless you get the layoffs. But, yes. So what I would want the related, to say, the related, you will get the layoffs. Let me, let me just finish, David. Okay. What I would like to do is to see the layoffs that are occurring in the airline industry or in the... In the um, restaurant business. That would be the symptom that we're starting the multiplier that we're all familiar with. And those people then would lose their revenues and they would start spending less, not spending different things, not shifting from airlines to toilet paper, but actually shrinking in the economy. Yeah. So, so, so far we've started seeing uh, furloughs of uh, pilots and flight attendants in the airline industry. So some of that has started. Uh, we've also seen cancellations of uh, aircraft, I mean, you know, kind of one of the uh, aspects of this is that uh, don't expect Boeing to get back in production soon because the airlines are not anxious to take airplanes right now. So we are seeing an impact in that regard, but I think there's a lot what more. You're, what you're saying are not multiplier effects. The multiplier effects come from people losing their revenues. The, the, it is true for the furloughed uh, employees, but right. that's a small story at this point. So the question is, which, David, you want to jump in? Yeah, one of the one of the stronger growing sectors is in the hospitality sector of the economy, and those aren't the high high flying people who fly airplanes. The, the, those people are people who make up rooms and, and, and work for hotels, and hotel occupancy is cratering everywhere, and that's where you're going to see lots of layoffs, and that's a very job intensive industry. Yeah. But but let, let's think about what the traditional recession is, which is uh, collapsing construction and automobile manufacturing because of the lack of need of buying durable items. When you build up a whole inventory, consumer inventory of durables, which is uh, <clears throat> homes and automobiles you've been building for the whole expansion, you can postpone purchasing of that for a long period of time. And the cratering that occurs in recession to me is mostly about postponing stuff. And <clears throat> what you're talking about is not a sector which is postponing, it's that and we're so worried about whether the coronavirus is going to have an impact. We don't have an audience here. It all comes from response, uh, shrinking in in order to avoid relationships with other people. 
But it, that does seems to me to be a kind of temporary phenomenon, yeah. unlike the automobile or construction industry in a typical recession. Yeah, so so if, if we can get this kind of coronavirus and everybody calm down, which I think is a total overreaction. I'd love to see the audience here today. Uh, we don't have this in the flu season, which happens all the time, too. And there's lots of deaths associated with that. So there, to me, all the sales in Costco of toilet paper and the fact that there's no audience here and, uh, and the fact that uh, 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 the stock market has gone down 20 percent, that to me seems to be an overreaction to the absolute news we have, unless we had some real evidence that the coronavirus is going to be a whole lot worse than we see, which, which my other question would go to William, I'll ask in a second, or to you as a surrogate is um, what, what do we really know about this coronavirus? Yeah, so, so in other words, our forecast is going to be contingent on the, David's idea is that uh, this is going to be like a three or four month thing. And then all that pulling back that we've done will end and we'll go back and go on the airplanes and go to the retail and it'll be short live, small uh, GDP effect. That's premised on a particular path for the coronavirus and be ideal if we had real knowledge of what that path might be. Right. And that's something that we don't know. But, uh, you know, you were referring to a typical recession, which means the 11 recessions post World War II. Not one of them was caused by a pandemic. They had other causes. So uh, this, if indeed it induces a recession, it will be very different than the data that we look at. And, yeah. and the answer to, to Lila's question then is going to be very different too. The things that you should monitor that tell you that, yes, the stock market correctly went down by 20%. And uh, the things that you would monitor would be different this recession than in any one that we've had since World War II. Co correct. Yeah. yeah. So um, oh, go ahead, David. No, I was just, I'm just agreeing with that. I think this is, this is a different... I think this is a different recession. Speaking to what you're talking about, uh, cars and housing, uh, anecdotal evidence mm -hmm. suggests is that people are still visiting new home tracks, uh, and housing seems to be doing okay. We had built in the, this forecast and the prior forecast to slow down in cars because we think there's been uh, there's a credit problem. Uh, there's a credit problem in, in auto credit, mm -hmm. and the, the virus here will make it worse. And people start losing jobs. So I, I want to add to you a comment to your forecast, which I think you subtract 0.7 percent from GDP growth. And On a fourth to fourth basis, yes. But I think it'll be much worse now. Yeah, you say worse, but that number is within the noise of typical GDP number. We have that up and down by maybe at least one and a half percent on a quarter by quarter basis. So that's still saying that the virus impact on GDP is pretty small, which I think is legitimate. but. But it's still the audience should understand that that's kind of the background noise if that's happening to GDP variability all the time. So it sounds yeah. like to me what would be useful is to have in terms of things to monitor both indicators of emotion, sort of how consumers and businesses are feeling, and then be able to contrast that or compare that to measures of, of sort of real economic activity for us to be able to figure out is this recession, something that's um, kind of being driven more by emotion, which maybe we haven't seen recently, or driven by kind of economic fundamentals. Does that sound reasonable? Yeah, so that goes back to something that uh, that A.C. Pagu worked on in the early part of the 20th century about emotions and sentiment and business cycles. And he had this uh, famous quote that, uh, that the error of optimism in an expansion uh, gives way to the era of pessimism in a contraction that is uh, born not a baby but a giant. You know, I mean, you know, when people turn pessimistic, they, they turn very pessimistic, which I think is what you were describing as, as could be a real possibility this time. But uh, in Pagu's research, he said that's a really important part of what happens to the demand for goods and services. So the emotions that are affecting this economic downturn are quite unlike the ones that have been occurring historically, because now people are not afraid the economy is going to slow. They're afraid the, the coronavirus is going to consume us all. So we're going to pull ourselves away from everybody else so that we don't get grabbed by the coronavirus. Well, typically, the reason people are fearful 
in a preceding recession or in the early phase of it because they think they're going to lose their jobs. They think this economic downturn is going to come. So we might be going from one kind of fear to the next one. And that would be another thing you want to monitor, the extent to which people have moved their fears about the coronavirus into the fear about the economic recession occurring. Then they pull back. Then they build up cash as a stockpile against the down, the bad things that are going to happen later on. I, I want to talk about the, how severe this is because we've had passed among us an uh, image that shows the a dramatic image that shows the number of coronavirus cases per uh, I think per per, per hundred thousand per million people. Yeah, per million people. And, uh, and we, it shows, this is in an email that circulated amongst uh, shows, the forecast economists. Yeah, it shows the, uh, the uh, China booming up, but China's huge. So you divide by the population, it's not that big. It peaks out about uh, <clears throat> one per 10,000. That's the peak. Uh, Angela Merkel today said 33% uh, of their Germans are going to get this disease. I don't know what she thought, but that's a whole lot more than one in 10,000. That's 3,000 and 10,000, and it's a huge difference if that's what really occurs. But what's optimistic about this image is that within 45 days or so, this thing had peaked out in China. You can see all the other countries are growing. Some of them show some curvature as well. So I think that that side is the most optimistic I've ever seen with regard to the coronavirus. Now, I don't know whether how much of that shape is due to the preventive measures that have been used in China and used here, which are obviously going to have an impact. And so then the question is, does it remain with all these preventive medis, uh, measures that we took, are we going to have this kind of constant threat that maintains at the same level and we're going to have an empty uh, audience here for the next year or two that sits behind us? Oh no, we're going to have a full audience for the June conference which is the first week of June okay. and is on real estate and, and residential construction. Uh, but back to coronavirus, uh, I'm skeptical of the data coming out of China. The SARS epidemic, uh, which Williams' work uh, focused on, uh, was a public relations nightmare for the Communist Party. And so I'm not sure that their data is, is as accurate as we might like. If we look to South Korea, it looked like South Korea was peaking and, and, and maybe was going to turn the corner. Now it is, uh, it, it's uh, on the uptick again. So I think there's just much that we don't know yet. We're in, in, in a real early stage in this regard. So I wish William was up here because I wondered the extent to which SARS is giving us an understanding of what's happening here. Because what's happening here is totally unique in this country. In the sense I, that we are I, I, yeah, shutting I agree. down universities, shutting down conferences, all, and uh, avoiding. Well, it happened in 1918. It, it, it yeah, happened 1918, 100 years ago in our United that's States. That's before my history begins. So I wonder <laughs> whether the impact, economic impact of SARS, which William or you described, which hits the travel industry, but what about <clears throat> what about just living in Hong Kong? Everybody stay inside their homes and not go to restaurants where the schools all closed down. It, was it similar to what we have here, or was it a different kind of event? So, so there was a lot of fear associated with, with, with SARS. I, I don't know if we have real good data on... So, William, there was data on, uh, on GDP in Hong Kong, right? And it was yes. minus 4%? No, 2.6%. Minus 2.6% uh, on an annual basis. So, so we have on an annual basis minus 2.6%, but Hong Kong's a city state, so it's really hard to extrapolate but as, as well. My question. my question was, was the SARS response, the impact on GDP, was that similar to our response, where we all pulled in and we don't go to restaurants, we don't have conferences? <clears throat> if that was true, then I would say SARS was a, was a useful analogy, and, but otherwise, no. Yeah, so I mean, I, th I think that's an open... <laughs> Question certainly in Hong Kong, there was a lot of fear, and and at that time, uh, people did stay in. But is it like what we're seeing today, with the 450 people watching this remotely? Uh, I think that's an open question, and what the ultimate impact is is going to be, and sort of uh, wait and see. this is the uncertainty that we've been talking about. 
And I, I think have one one more question for that the audience suggests. Okay. They don't want to know what GDP growth is going to be next year. They want to know whether the stock market's a bargain or not, and whether they should buy in. And I'd like to hear David's comment on this too, which is a ten-year Treasury that was down to uh, half a percent. I guess it's back to seventy-five basis points mm -hmm. now. That to me is um, offers the most pessimistic forecast not just for this next year, but for the whole next decade. You're gonna tie up your money in a 10 year treasury, and it's only gonna pay a half a percent per year. And, and, so and, I think and a 30 year treasury at 1.1. 1 .1. Yeah, so this is the so last question, so, so David, it's for you. Okay, the, well the thing is, is in the past we've had, uh, my, my friend David Costin at Goldman Sachs, who has appeared, who has appeared at, oh. at, the, at the forecast, put out a note this morning saying his view is, is that there's another 15%, and this he said this before the big drop this morning. He said the S&P 500, which is called 2900 or 2850, was going to drop to 2450, and then rebound back over 3000 by the end of the year, which is a little too cute, but that's what, his, that's what his note said this morning, and he cut his corporate profits estimate from being flat. He already cut it once. He cut it to corporate profits down 5%. That's his view. Um, my sense is, is we've had several of these sharp declines stop at down 20%, which is where we are right now. So my sense is if, if the market sort of holds here, we're probably okay. Uh, if it goes low, otherwise we could go down to as 2400. But if you look at a year or two years and you assume that this, this, this uh, pandemic sort of runs its course by the end of the summer, uh, Stocks probably will be higher a year from now than they are now. He says buy. He, he says buy. Not BYE. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and so that, that, that's my sense. And also, is this, you also we're going to also be in this extraordinarily low interest rate environment because the Fed's not going to raise rates from wherever they, they stop it at. If it's zero or if it's uh, three-eighths of a percent, they're not going to raise rates until they see inflation. And that may take a while. So we, it's we, ordinarily stimulative environment. we as a nation should take advantage of those incredibly low interest rates. Governments at every level should borrow, should and borrow invest, like crazy, borrow and like crazy and invest in infrastructure. Okay. Absolutely. <laughs> and on, on that advice for oh, the no, Trump administration. Comment, guys, before you end, Jerry. <laughs> yes. Uh, Alan Blinder, professor of economics at Princeton. Yes. Former member of the Federal Reserve Board said on television this morning that when the NDER meets a year from now, they will say the recession began this month. Oh, I don't believe that. <laughs> okay, so on that happy note, this ends the forecast session. Uh, of, and uh, so click over to the next video. You'll have three more videos. Uh, one will be Ed's talking about minimum wage, Lila talking about uh, congestion, and homelessness and migration in the Bay Area, and, and more generally how that's gonna affect California. And then our keynote conversation, uh, we'll get a view from outside the forecast with uh, Joe Bersuelas, who is Chief Economist from RSM. So click on over to the next video, and we look forward to seeing you there.